Good morning, everybody. We're continuing in Clashing Worldviews in the U.S. Supreme Court. We're going to continue in Chapter 9. And again, this chapter talks about, okay, if you take the logic of conservative Protestantism and progressive Protestantism as it is applied to liberty, equality, and justice and apply it out to its logical conclusions, what will America look like? What will public policy look like? What will government and its role in society, what will that look like? Okay, and again, this, this is, I think, helpful um, because few people that I know actually take logic to its conclusion and think it through. Okay, if we go this way, you know, this is what, this is what the future is going to be like. Now, again, when we're saying this in this chapter, I want to make this very clear. We tried to make it clear in this chapter um, is uh, many of these issues we're talking about, Rehnquist and Blackman didn't weigh in on them because of, you know, they were off the court by this time and some of these issues are coming up now. But if you understand their worldview, you can get a pretty good hunch at to which way they're going, okay, right? In other words, this is, this is a bit of an educated guess and we acknowledge that as such in the chapter, okay? So just lest anyone think this is exactly what they ruled, on, it's not really true because some of these they never got a chance to, to get into too much. You know, SOGI laws, sexual orientation and gender identity laws were not a thing in 2005 when uh, you know Justice, Black, or Justice, Justice Rehnquist died. It, it was not a thing in 1999 when Harry Blackman died. You but, said but, so Soji laws, sexual orientation and gender identity laws. Okay, this idea that a man may, who thinks he's a woman may compete uh, on, a, on, a, on a female soccer team, may go into a woman's locker room, may go into women's showers, with other women, may go into a woman's bathroom, okay? Those, the Equality Act that Congress has, uh, the, the, the Democrats have proposed this year, it's not passed, it will make that federal law, okay? In other words, SOGI laws are within different states right now, based on state legislatures, but it's not national. Uh, it's more like a patchwork quilt. Some states have them, some states don't. But but that that's what, if you hear the Equality Act, it's misnamed. It's trying, you know, can you institute equality between the genders to such that you've blurred all distinctions? And now we can use the same bathrooms, we can use the same locker rooms, we can use the same showers, we, all that, okay? That's where that's going, okay? That, that was not a thing in 1999. That was not a thing in 2005. That became a thing as... Uh, the Obergefell decision went through. Okay, proponents of gay marriage, homosexuals said, "Hey, just give us gay marriage, and that's all the farther it's going to go." And they made that claim over and over and over again. Okay, and that is a bold face lie. You know, we talked about this a little bit last week. I don't want to belabor the point, but okay, where are we going from this? You know, what's the next phase here in this ethical? Well, we would say degeneration. But they would say this ethical progress in our country. You know, again, polyamory, multiple partners in weddings and marriages, uh, pedophilia will be legalized, things like that. That's where it's going. Because again, if love is love and love wins and your personal preferences and your personal feelings and equality becomes the ultimate value, then these moral distinctions will have to be removed so that people can enjoy whatever they want to enjoy because that's what they think and feel. And, you know, we would say, of course, we would think, I'm thinking immediately of Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitfully wicked, above all things. In other words, don't you dare trust, let's just trust our heart. You know, America becomes a giant Hallmark movie, right? Just follow your heart. That's where this is headed. It's follow your heart, wherever, okay? So, meanwhile, back at the ranch, back in the chapter where we left off, I, I think we talked about, again, what you're seeing is like what they call um, uh, headwaters that are diverging, uh, where, you, where you've got, again, conservative Protestantism. There's fixed moral principles that God has set up. They're not changing, despite what culture says. And then progressive Protestantism is there are no fixed moral principles, or at least from the Bible. And the flow of society and the flow of culture determines what's right and wrong, good and true. So you're going to see an open-ended view of truth, an open-ended view of reality, an open-ended view of ethics and morals becomes whatever society basically wants. 
reality becomes socially constructed, truth becomes socially constructed, ethics becomes, when I say socially constructed, what does that mean? Socially constructed by reality. 51% of the people want it, whatever. And again, if, if, if the raw human heart without grace is your metric for what is right and good and true, what does it lead to? Well, it leads to paganism. To be candid, it leads to Sodom and Gomorrah. It leads to the Tower of Babel. It leads to, in other words, Genesis sets the stage for what is later repeated over and over and over in human history. Absent grace, we're going in that way, okay? Um, and so, so we were talking about this just before class started. You know, the, the progressive Protestant worldview led black men to adopt a, a, a philosophy of law based on the natural order of empirical knowledge. Again, what is empirical knowledge? It's knowledge gained by the five senses. That's it. What you can see, feel, hear, okay? That's what's good and right and true. That's what led him again in Roe versus Wade to say that, hey, based on scientific empirical knowledge, we don't think that this thing in the womb is a person. So because of that knowledge, we're gonna say um, up until the first trimester, that thing, that burden might be removed so that the woman can have more freedom and autonomy. Okay, that leads to that kind of thinking. In other words, you're not thinking that that's a, that's a person. Okay, so, so in other words, you see what that means when you say empiricism, th think, again, think science, and there's, again, there's nothing wrong with science, Science does not require scientific naturalism to use the tool. Think of science as a tool, okay? The, you know, the, the same ice pick, you know, that could kill somebody is also the same ice pick that can, well, get rid of ice on your window or something. You know, in other words, the issue is not the tool itself. It's who's using it and what they're doing with it. And who's using it is the worldview behind it, right? That, 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 that's what we're talking about, okay? Um, and so, are, oh. Are they really saying, or are you kind of putting that into words that we're supposed to be saying, are they really saying that it's not a human? Yes, they are. They, 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 would say, say they would say it's a human, but it's not a person yet. Yeah. And when I, I'm, I'm using that term person intentionally, okay? Because within the 14th Amendment, remember there's three clauses mm -hmm. within the 14th Amendment, okay? that apply to the states and limit state governments. In this case, limit state governments from preventing abortion. There's the due process clause, there's the privileges and immunity clause, and there's the uh, equality clause, equal protection of the law. It says no person shall be denied equal protection of the laws. So if a fetus is merely a human and not a person, as defined by the Supreme Court, it does not enjoy equal protection under the laws of the right to life. Does that make sense? I, I literally, I quoted as much as I could true constitutional law. That word person is very, very significant. It's not accidental. They, they say that, that that is a human in the womb, but it's not a person yet Contin you know, it, that, that can enjoy constitutional protections under the 14th Amendment's equal protection laws. And that, that's, what that's what they're fighting for right now in Congress is that from the Conception Act, the life of conception, at the moment of conception, that is a person. When is it a person? That okay. is a person at the moment of conception and it's allowed to go under the force from a Amendment. From a conservative Protestant standpoint, yes, that is true. But that's what they're and trying I would to agree with right that. now. From a progressive Protestant standpoint, no. And so, so what's the marker then? How do you know it's, a, when do you know it's a person? when science and empiricism tell you it is. And I talked about this before in the chapter on abortion. Uh, in, in 1968, Harvard developed something called the Harvard Criteria, okay? When does a human shift from being a human to a person? When that human can now live a psychologically satisfying life. Can you live a satisfying, psychologically satisfying life in the womb? The answer is no. Can you date somebody? Can you go out with somebody? Can you reason? Can you get a job? Can you feel a sense of purpose? Okay, that applies in the womb. That applies also as you're very, very old and your mental capacities are fading and you're no longer able to do it under that, under that logic. Because the Harvard criteria was this idea of, okay, when do we call it? When, when do we say that person's dead? 
You know, at what point do we pull the plug? And so they created, again, a scientific, human-centered line of thinking that when that person in that hospital room is unable to live a psychologically satisfying life because they're in a vegetative state or something like that, then yes, ethically, this is medical ethics. I mean, I'm sure Doc knows all this. You can pull the plug. That same logic has gone into the abortion debate and that informed Harry Blackman when he created Roe versus Wade. Does that make sense, Doc? So, so that, that word person is very intentional because the 14th Amendment uses the word person. Yes. The 14th Amendment was created specifically for the freed African-American slaves. Right. It was never meant to be applied to abortion, to gay rights, to gay marriage, to euthanasia, any of that. It was, in other words, if you, want, if you want to deal with that, get legislation written and passed and get argument and persuasion and dialogue taking place so that we can have a national conversation. That's how you do it. You don't do it through the, the courts, which bypasses all of that, but they've done it. And that's, in other words, so the Supreme Court, beginning in the 1880s, began to interpret that word persons broadly to apply to corporations, corporations are people too, and to women, yeah, that, that it's, if you know, uh, if you know anything about 1880s, 1890 America, it was the principle of laissez-faire capitalism was big. In other words, government, get your hands off. And so they said, are there, do people work in corporations? Yes. Is a corporation a bunch of people? Yeah. Do, do people have free speech rights? Do people have equal protection? Yes. And so do corporations. And so they began to, so, and that began this long march to where we are today, where persons means a, a, a transgender person, a homosexual person, a woman who, who wants to have an abortion, all of those persons have come under the umbrella of the 14th Amendment and has begun to smack down state legislation. Okay, that's something called selective incorporation. Remember, we talked about that in chapter four, long and hard about that, that idea that, hey, this, the, the, the Supreme Court striking down state laws has gone through the portal of the 14th Amendment in a way that was never intended by the creators of the 14th Amendment. <clears throat> okay, uh, civil rights movement, yeah. Use the 14th Amendment all day long. That's what it was for, you know, for African Americans. It was not meant for every Tom, Dick, and Harry to come to the Supreme Court and say, hey, I need my rights because I've got an interest. And you've heard me say this, you probably get sick of me saying it, and I, I would respond, then get your own amendment and get your own legislation. Work at it just like the founders set it up. Don't you dare try to short do a do a you know an end around the the the, the democratic system by going through the courts. Okay. So that's that. Okay. So let's. Um, so the underlying issue, and I think, and, and I could talk about this for a long time today, but I will see. What I mean. But the underlying problem is religious fragmentation in America. Okay. In other words. There's, what has happened in America since the 1780s is America has shifted for being dominated by the Protestant worldview to becoming more of a decentralized, pluralistic, secular, secularized America. Okay, in other words, where, in other words, the reason where we get this idea of Christian America, America is, was a Christian nation, is because by and large, most of, your, most of the people in America and most of your politicians and judges and so forth were, had a Protestant worldview, you know, had a Christian worldview to some degree. I didn't say they're all Christians, but the, the by and large, what, what the Bible said, okay, that began to shift in the 1880s and 1890s after the Civil War, and it's changed, it's much more radical now, so it's, it's splintered. So now, Again, you, you've got this idea, okay, whose view of reality is going to take shape in law and in public policy? That's, that's, what America, that's what makes America, America. It's us lobbying for those types of things, okay? I added this, this isn't in the book, but I thought this was really significant, okay, to, to help you understand this statement, okay? Religious fragmentation. That, in other words, we're seeing... When you see the rise of critical race theory, you, the rise of cultural Marxism, the rise of the sexual revolution, uh, and the repudiation of America's founding, you're seeing a totally different worldview rise up. Okay? Now, we can look at that, and I tend to look at that as the boogeyman. That's bad. Okay? Let's be honest, let's be candid. 
when the Catholic Church was dominant in medieval Europe, they had a statement that went something like this, error has no rights. So if you weren't a Catholic, you were subjected to the Inquisition and all kinds of things that weren't good. In other words, the dominant worldview persecuted those who were on the outside. That's why Europe is so secular today because they look at that as that's wrong and that's bad and they're right. That is wrong. To say error has no rights is wrong. You can, you can go to any Islamic state you want and you'll get that. Error has no rights, right? If you're not Muslim, okay? And, and so, so when we see the rise of, of secular fundamentalism right now in America, dominant within Congress and all that kind of stuff, what you're seeing is the repeat performance of what Christians have done throughout history and Muslims have done throughout history. That, my friends, is the genius of the First Amendment Religious Liberty Clause. James Madison saw all that, understood all that, said we're not having that in America. So that's why Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. In other words, there is no national orthodoxy, even though it seems like there is one right now, right? In other words, in other words what's the, was there a reigning orthodoxy in America at our founding? In some degree, yeah, it was Christian, Protestant Christianity. But does the Constitution mandate that the federal government should push Protestant Christianity? The answer is no. Should, should Congress and, and the federal government push secular fundamentalism today? No. Are they? In many respects, yes. Is that a violation of the Establishment Clause? The answer is yes. In other words, I, I want you to see both, there, nobody's innocent in this, okay? Again, it's very easy to look at, look at secular fundamentalism and the progressives as the boogeyman and the bad guy. But Christians have been guilty of this too. In fact, that's why Madison created the First Amendment because he saw how much religious persecution was happening in Christian America from 1620 to 1789 when he wrote, or it was 1791 when he wrote the First Amendment. Christians were persecuting Christians in Christian America. There was no religious liberty in America in the sense that Baptists were put in, put in jail because they weren't, they weren't Anglicans and vice versa in these different states. So, so what they try to do is create a secular space for the federal government. In other words, nobody's our dominant orthodoxy, but understanding that the people are a religious and devout people and they may freely practice their religion however they want, but the federal government is not going to mandate this or that, give people space, because we've seen what happens in medieval Europe when people aren't given space. The people in power are going to persecute the people that are not in power. Does that make sense? What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Christians did it. Muslims have done it in the Middle East. Secular fundamentalists are doing it today. All of it is wrong. So how should we then live? Isn't that the perennial question? How should we then live? And, and, and what you'll find in the end of the book, if you actually read to the end, is we advocate federalism is it kick this thing back down at the state level, in local, local communities. Let them decide. If you think California is too liberal, then move to Texas. Or, in other words, while still allowing a federal government, allow, remove, in other words, you'll, you'd have to literally totally reverse many of these Supreme Court decisions that are already in place. Roe versus Wade, Obergefell, all these, and get rid of them, and allow the states for themselves to ch choose what they want to do on these issues. Some states, Christian, conservative Christians will agree with. Some states, progressive Christians will disagree with. So the idea, the way the founders set up, each state was meant to be a social laboratory. If you don't like how they're doing economics and social things in Illinois, move to Indiana or something like that. Is that radical? Yeah, that's our proposal. That we, we made that proposal because we said, to quote Abraham Lincoln, how can a nation exist that is half slave and half free. And he actually quoted what Jesus said when he said um, uh, a nation divided. You know, when a kingdom div is divided against itself, it can't stand. So we're saying, okay, fine. We realize that. We realize there's two worldviews. We realize you cannot impose orthodoxy on the rest of the people that don't agree with you from the national government. Fine. The solution is what the framers had all in mind from the beginning. Let the individual states decide what they want to do on these issues.
I'm getting ahead of myself. I just told you the punchline of the whole book. Okay. So the underlying problem is religious fragmentation. Oh, it just did it again. Why is it doing this? Yeah, you did that yourself and you touched it. Did I, t I didn't touch it? Oh, I didn't think so. Here. Sorry, people. Hey, those of you that are watching from home, hang in there. Okay, I have to fix something in the computer and why it decided to do this right now at the most awkward moment is um, only, only the Lord knows. Um, any questions while I'm trying to fix this from anybody? I'm just going to find the particular icon that allows it. Hang in here. Awkward silence ensues. There it is. Huh. Okay, now it's not allowing me to display. Well, there it is. Thank you. No, stop. Sorry, people. There's an awkward silence. But we'll make this work. I'm just trying to get the screen back. What I have to do is I have to go back and tell my computer to, to go back to the Apple TV display that it so frustratingly got rid of. Okay, so religious fragmentation is, um, is an issue, okay? And, and um, I provided a quote here on the slide once it gets back up here from, um, it's called the American Commonwealth, okay? This was by um, Lord James Bryce who was the British uh, ambassador to America in the early 20th century. And what he said, because he was, he was remarking on America, he was kind of like Alexei de Tocqueville. He was like, man, America's fascinating how they do things. And he said a couple of things, okay? He said, Christianity is in fact understood to be, though not legally, and that's really important, that's true, not legally, the established religion, yet the national religion. So he said, he said America's interesting because Again, think Britain. Is there an established religion in Britain? Yes, there is. It's called the Anglican Church. It still is. Okay? In America, there isn't one. And yet he said, but all these people are very Christian. It's amazing. How do they do that? And then he reflected long and hard on the consequences if that ceased to be. I don't know why it's doing this. I'll just use this. I'm not going to keep fighting this. And, um, and so what, he, what mattered to him is, okay, what if the Christian faith, which was the social cohesion of the nation... Stop being the social cohesion of the nation, what would happen? And he said this, he said, I was startled by the thought of what might befall this huge and delicate fabric of laws and commerce and social institutions were the foundation that it had rested on to crumble away. And so, so what he's saying is, okay, what would happen if Christianity ceased to be the dominant worldview of the country? Okay, and he goes on and he says this. Um, let's see if I can get to the next thing. He says, America is the country in which the loss of faith in the invisible might produce the completest revolution because it is the country where men have been least want to revere anything in the visible world. Okay, so in other words, if, if Christianity ceased to be the dominant worldview, what makes America work? You know, it's a free country. There's free commerce. Everyone can be free to do whatever they want, okay? What keeps that freedom in check before it turns into license? The very fact that Christianity is kind of like the social glue. And he said, but if you remove that social glue, he said, I see a complete revolution in the country where all of it would start breaking down, okay? And if you look at what's going on in 2021 America, in so many areas, that is exactly, exactly what it foresaw. And I, I think that's a really good, in other words, we're talking about religious fragmentation when Christianity ceases to be the dominant worldview in the country. From a biblical standpoint, does that mean that there is no dominant God for America? No, there's, there's another God. It's called an idol, right? We know from scripture, it says very clearly, serve God, serve idols. If you don't serve God, Hosea 8, 4 says, then you'll be given over to idols for destruction. And that is what, I firmly believe, because the Bible says that, that's what's happening in America. We, we, have, we have changed gods, and we're, we're bearing the consequences. Economically in this country, all this debt, right? Foreign policy, we're very confused, scratching our heads. We don't know what we're doing. Social cohesion, 
masks, no masks, vax, no vax, sexual revolution, critical race, all, all that stuff is a result of, okay, fine. I mean, the analogy I always get when I think about this, forgive me, big Indiana Jones fan. Okay, very first movie, my favorite one. And the classic scene, when they finally go in and they find out where the, where the Ark of the Covenant is, and they go down into the Well of Souls, and they look inside in the Well of Souls, and they gotta go down there, right? And there's all these snakes everywhere, right? The, the classic snake scene, right? And, and so as they go down, they, they spray gasoline, they burn all the snakes away, and they've got this torch. And as long as that torch is really, really lit, all the snakes are kept at bay. But what happens? The torch ends up going out, and they begin to encroach. Same principle, you know, we talk about shining our light. You know, the issue is not so much, you know, they didn't, they didn't have to scream at the snakes to get them to come back, leave, leave. just have a lot of light and fire. That keeps them away. Well, in America, when, when, when the fire of, of God's presence, God's goodness, God's faithfulness within the churches, the people of God, the people of America starts fading, don't be surprised when all this stuff starts coming in. That, that, that's really what's happening. Um, think of Ephesians 3.20 in, in the message paraphrase. It says, the church is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. In other words, as the church goes, that's how the world goes. Right? I mean, it's true. That, and that's, in other words, when we're talking about religious fragmentation, it's just, you know, again, Christians have blown it by persecuting non-Christians Muslims have blown it, and now we're seeing secular humanists and fundamentalists blow it because they're doing the exact same thing. And again, this is what Madison was very concerned about. That's why he created the First Amendment, to keep people, allow people space to operate in a non-religious public square, understanding that everyone's going to bring their viewpoint in, and that's totally fine. But don't you dare mandate what is right and good and true from the federal level upon all the people. Let the people, through their state elected representatives, let them do it. That's how it was meant to be done. You want orthodoxy? Fine. Do it at the state level. And if you don't like the reigning orthodoxy in California, move to a state that embraces more of your worldview. That's how the founders set it up. Okay? Is there a difference between freedom and liberty? No, I mean, I mean pretty much the same thing. I mean, the message in the word the spirit of the is there's freedom in some verses and liberty, but does that mean? Well, it still re respects free will. Sure it does. Whether it's, you know, there, there's liberty. What, where the spirit of the Lord is liberty, what does that word liberty mean? Well, that can mean free, liberty from sin, liberty from sin's bondage, but liberty right from the choose. works of the flesh. Yeah, you have right but you have, yeah, but you still have a free, yeah. Where the spirit of the Lord is there's liberty, that means specifically th this idea of, of and again, the context he's talking about, he's contrasting with the Jewish law. We are free from legalistic practices, do this, do that. Well, right? I'm thinking in today's set, what we're talking about. But what we're if talking we about. We have free will, we have a right to be able to choose. But the government's coming in and said, this is what you're going to choose. So we have no freedom, right? Yeah, in that case, yeah. Th that's a violation. Because again, the premise of soul liberty, soul freedom, to believe whatever you want to believe is based on what, you know, even God doesn't create us as mannequins that must believe him. He gives us a free will. That same logic, when James Madison understood that, and he said, okay, we need to, we need to fashion the federal government the same way as it applies to your conscience. Government, you freely believe what you want to believe. Government's not going to tell you. Now, there are consequences for certain actions, based on your religious belief. I'll give you an example of one. In the 1990 case, Employment Division versus Smith, there was a case where in Oregon, in the Health Department of Oregon, this is ironic, there were employees for the Oregon Health Department who were smoking peyote on the job, getting high. Dude, right? The irony is it's the Oregon Health Department. Hello, okay? But when they got fired for it, based on violation of, you know, can't get high and smoke, you know, drugs on the job. Hey, we're, we're Native American Indians, and that's part of our worship, okay? Went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court cited against the Native American Indians and said, listen, we understood that you sincerely held religious belief. However, for the sake of the common good of other employees in the health department, probably don't want to do that. 
Okay, in other words, there's consequences. Uh, there, there was a case, the McReynolds case in 1892, that criminalized polygamy practiced by Mormons. In other words, the, the, the First Amendment Religious Liberty Clause allows you to freely believe whatever you want, but the challenge is, okay, now when your ex expression of your right begins to infringe on the expression of somebody else's right, where do we draw the line? And the logic that was used, of course, in the polygamy cases, for the common good of America, children need one mom and one dad. One would think you could apply that to the Obergefell case, couldn't you? Right? And, and they thought it's not good for society that way. But that's, does that make sense? Right. But I'm just thinking, we're all being slaves or being made into a slave state because of the government putting those on and we have, and we have a choice. Then. Yeah. So, okay. Being, so considered uh, standing with the government or being rebellious. You're thinking, you're thinking like a conservative Protestant. Okay. A conservative Protestant would think, hey, we've got free will. We are responsible to God and ourselves for what we do. So we know better how to take care of ourselves than the government does. So we would say, no, I don't want the government's role in this, this, and this. A progressive Protestant would say, no, it's freedom through government action. And so they're gonna, they're gonna be much more open to seeing the government come in and mandate things because the assumption is they might do a better job of taking care of you than you can. In other words, your, your response right there reveals very clearly that you're thinking from a conservative Protestant viewpoint. Is you're like, wait a minute, I'm emphasizing freedom, free will to do this and that. You know, and, and you're seeing, that, anyway, I don't want to get on this too long, but you're seeing the states, vax, no vax, max, uh, masks, no masks, the ones that are more conservative and Republican are much more freer, and the ones that are more democratic are much more draconian, and you, you will do this or that and the other thing. But they really think that the government knows more how to take care of us than we do. It's, it's a totally different conception of what government is, okay? So, so anyway, what Bryce was trying to say is exactly what's happening in America. Is there a revolution going on in America? Yes, there is a revolution going on in America. What type of a revolution? A cultural revolution. Are we going to go with the spirit of 1776 and its principles and its, its conservative principles based on scriptures? Or are we going to go with the revolution, revolution of 1789, the French Revolution, which wanted to get rid of any type of religious influence in the public square whatsoever, and they wanted to get rid of monarchy, and they pretty much wanted to, well, burn the system down and start anew. And that's what they, they tried. They literally created a brand new calendar, and they started anew, year zero. Okay? They put up the goddess of reason in, 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 the, in the Cathedral of Notre Dame, and they bowed down and worshipped to her. So they said human reason, disconnected from God, is ultimate. Let's get rid of the old system. Let's start. And that, that, so in other words, when he's talked about co completest revolution, he knew more than he, I mean, he revealed much more than he knew, or he knew more. Anyway, you know what I'm saying? In other words, I don't think he fully understood the full impact of that. That's exactly what's happening right now. It's exactly what's happening as these worldviews change, okay? Um, so when people with different worldviews do not always recognize the same rules, for personal behavior or for the structure of society, each side will attempt to use government to define public policy and constrain the behavior of its neighbors. And that is really true. Okay, from a conservative pro, do we want government to intervene in society? Yes, we do. In which areas? Pornography, limiting abortion, restricting gay marriage, restricting gambling casinos, restricting the legalization of marijuana. So in other words, before we pick on the progressives for, gosh, they want government to, so do we, so do we, so do we. Because we want to uphold traditional values, we want to uphold biblical morality, and we see the role of government to get involved in that area, to champion it. So I, I want to make that really clear. that Because again, a lot of Christians don't understand this. All those Democrats, those progressives, they just want to get involved in government and regulate our lives. So do we. So do we. And, and so, are you saying that's wrong, Pat? No, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying let's understand that first, okay? Because sometimes you've got to agree with your adversary quickly. And you have to say, candidly, yes, we would say, because again, what is the purpose of government? Go back to Romans 13. It does two things. Restrain sin and condone the good. 
So, so when we would say, hey, I want laws prohibiting homosexuality, homosexual practice, I want laws prohibiting uh, homosexual marriage, I want laws prohibiting abortion, we're saying that that is restraining a sin and it is condoning something good. Well, what is it condoning that's good? Well, the life in the womb was a real person. What are we condoning? That heterosexual sexual practice and heterosexual marriage leads to the greatest degree of human flourishing because that's how we're made. It is a, we live in a moral universe and God has said, you are, humans are made in my image, male and female, he created them. In other words, so as we're thinking about abortion and gay, gay rights and all that kind of stuff, and where we would see the government getting involved, again, is based on our worldview and based on what we see the government's, you know, what is government supposed to do? Condone the good and restrain sin. The progressives would say the exact same thing. Now, they may not interpret Romans 13 that way, but the good for them is unbridled equality and unbridled liberty and redistributive justice. Let's redistribute wealth. Let's take from the one percenters and give to the rest. Let's redistribute power. Are white people in power in America? Yeah, let's take it away from them and give it to the oppressed peoples. In other words, they're gonna try to condone, I mean, restrain sin and condone the good, but they're coming at it from a totally different angle. Okay, that, that's what we're saying, okay? So that's where we get, okay, what would America's future be if you took their logic of these, these two worldviews to their conclusion, okay? I wanna say this real clearly too. This chapter was the quickest chapter written in this book, and oh, how I wished we would have had more time. We wrote this chapter, the, the, the manuscript was due December 1st. We started writing this chapter at the end of October. Okay, so we literally wrote this in, le in less than a month. And we were flying. And it was primarily Sharina and I, because Jim had a court case he was dealing with. He said, guys, I, am, I can't deal with this right now. I gotta be in court. And so, I, and I think it turned out really well. But I really wish we could have taken more time. Because it was just like, I got done, I'm like, oh, I wish I would have said that. Oh, I wish I would have, and you're like, what are you gonna do? When you're under a deadline, you gotta do what you gotta do. So, anyway. Um, so, liberty, equality, justice under Blackman's progressive Constitution, okay? And so, um, again, he's coming at it from humans are basically good. So if you think humans are basically good, you're gonna look at equality, liberty, and justice very different than a conservative Protestant, okay? And so, because often the worst examples of sinful society are on the state and local levels, such as during the civil rights movement. Is that true? Yeah, there, there, was there some really bad things done at the local level against black people, Jim Crow laws, all that kind of stuff, yes, okay? Because of that, a progressive Protestant is gonna look at state and local government as the bad guys, and so they, they see the federal government as the savior, the solution, through the Supreme Court and through acts of Congress. So don't be surprised when we start looking at this is more and more power goes up to the federal government and gets removed from state and local governments to make their decisions for them, okay? Remember, the progressive Protestants draw upon the, one of the key aspects of progressive Christianity, humans are basically good. So if humans are basically good and government is made of people and people are no longer flawed, then government is good. And so the federal government is good. So we can start giving unelected bureaucrats and unelected justices more and more power because they're good and they will make better decisions because after all, they got more law degrees than you do and they know more than you do and the PhDs that are advising in, in chemistry and, and medicine and so on and so forth that are advising Congress and bureaucrats, they're smarter than we are. They will do better, they'll do a better job of making decisions for us. That's where they came from. They really think that, they really think that. But we would say, whoa, everyone's a sinner. Don't you dare give that much power away to those people because they're going to blow it. They're going to, they're going to be flawed in some way, shape, or form. It's, okay, I'll just say them. It's, it's any non-denominational church with a pastor who is no longer accountable to any other pastor or organization over him or board. It applies to everybody. We're all sinners. We all need... 
boards, elders, people above us in all capacities. Okay, this is not just a government thing. It's a human nature thing. Okay, welcome to the human race. Okay? Progressive Protestants view historical, scientific, and cultural change positively. Again, because they've got a very imminent view of God. Their view of God is very imminent within the creation. So as culture changes, that's God. Okay? So they say as society evolves, that's God. We don't usually say that as conservative Protestants. If we say God moved, maybe God removed a leader, right? Maybe God intervened and prevented some really, really bad law from happening. Maybe God got involved in miraculously and changed the mind of a congressman or somebody, and suddenly now they started making better decisions. We would say, yes, that's God. But we would never say, hey, the way the world's going, that's God. Because why? I'm sorry, what? Because he never goes against his word. He never go, goes against his word. What does the Bible say about the world in particular? Can you think of some just off your head? We're sojourners in this world. This world is it is established. We're, We're sojourners. Home. This world is not our home. So it means perhaps, um, well, the word doesn't really say that, but it implies that. But this idea that, hey, we're never meant to be feeling at home in whatever's going on. But uh, 1 John 2. Love not the world or the things that are in the world because of the lust of the flesh and the pride of life uh, and the cravings of the eyes, right? They're not a, they're, they don't reflect the love of the Father, right? There's all kinds of examples of that. You know, Jesus talks about, you know, in this world you face tribulation. So there's, there's all kinds of examples that the world, you know, Romans 12, 1, do not be conformed to the image of this world. So it implies the world is sinful, the world is in rebellion towards God, so what it is doing doesn't necessarily, and most often doesn't say that that's God. So, but, but for a progressive Protestant, if God is not transcendent and he's embedded within the, the, the culture, then yes, you're going to say, how dare you fault that person for, because love is love. And if that's what they feel. I encountered a young man yesterday at the grocery store, invited him to church, and he was so proud about talking about how gay he was. And he said, I was born that way, and I love Jesus, and God loves me because I was born that way. And in the short amount of time that I had, because there was a line and all that kind of stuff, you know, I said, hey, we're sinners. You're a sinner. You need to repent, just like we all do. And tried to get into a candid conversation with the kid. But as much as we could in that time, we never, you know, was, hey, he said he's coming to church. We'll see what happens. But anyway, but that, you know, they, a progressive process would say, yeah, if they're born that way, that's God. What, how, how are we to judge that? And so, yeah, it's very... Very different. Okay, very different. Look at God is love and Noah. You know, what happened with Noah? What happened there with the flood? Yeah, and, and see, God the, wouldn't have done that, but God has his ways and means to probably can do things. Yeah, the greatest of these is love. Romans 13. I mean, um, 1 Corinthians 13 is it 13, 12. Anyway, but God is not, you can't elevate love or equality or justice or liberty above God. And that's what you're seeing people do. In other words, you've got, you can't absolutize those things. God is God. And, and yes, he is love, but he also judges sin. And we're all sinners. And so you can't, you, you, and that, that's, and so many Christians fall prey to that. You know, this idea that, hey, love is love. So who am I to go against that as Christians? And it's like, no, you've absolute, you know, God is love, but love is not God. And you've got to make that distinction. And they make that. So drawn from Hegel and Darwinian ideas, progressive Protestants view truth and reality as an unfolding process, and consequently they do not revere the principles of limited government by the founders in the same way that we do, or conservative Protestants. Again, Hegel, what was Hegel? Brief review, newest is truest, latest is greatest. So the latest expression of culture, the latest expression of big government, the latest expression of the entitlement society, the latest expression of ethics and morals in our country, that is more true and valid than those crusty old founders who criminalized homosexuality and criminalized all kinds of behaviors that we as enlightened people and smarter people and newer people and we smell better because we use deodorant people think. Okay? We conservative process would say there's some things that are fixed and permanent. They never change even as we keep inventing new iPhones. 
Yes, keep inventing new iPhones, whatever. But there are certain things that don't, don't change in ethics and morals and things like that. Okay? R remember, for conservative Protestants, the ought determines the is. The ought, what God's word says, determines what should be in culture. Progressive Protestants reverse it. What is in culture determines what ought to be. So that, that in other words, there's no transcendent reference point. It's a theology from below. I'm getting my ethics from below. Whatever culture is doing from below, that's what we should be doing. That's what's right and true and allowable. And to an unbelieving world, that makes sense. Yeah, how dare you do this or that? Progressive Protestants' view of truth and reality leads them to embrace an open belief system uh, that social liberty and individual self-expression takes preeminence over ordered liberty. Okay, remember, a fundamental shift has happened in the Western world in America where we've gone from, I'm a sinner and um, I need the grace of God. And no government program, no amount of money, no amount of education is going to change that. I need Jesus. Two, from Jacques Rousseau, this idea that I'm born free and everything outside of me puts me in chains. So I must be allowed to freely express who I really am. And if you challenge me, you are my chains and I must remove those chains to be freely who I am. And it's healthy to be who I am and it is uh, liberating to be who I am and it is an injustice if laws are written to prevent me from who I am, that is very much within the progressive Protestant viewpoint. That is very much within the French Revolution mindset. Be who we are. Remove the chains of monarchy. Remove the chains of Christianity. Remove the chains of the church. Remove the chains of tradition so we can start anew. That is very much conservative Protestantism, or progressive Protestantism, that is very much the spirit and tone of the French Revolution. And the Soviet Revolution in 1917, and the Communist Revolution in China in 1949, and the Cultural Revolution that's currently being played. We've got a front row seat in America. Burn the system down. That's why we're tearing down statues. Again, it's very much in the spirit and tone of the French Revolution. We just don't have guillotines yet. Um, so, so again, they, they, again, I've already said all this. They reject, you know, uh, fixed moral principles. Okay, and so, so again, this is this is key. Okay, whereas conservative Protestants view ordered liberty as the key to maintaining the status quo of fixed moral standards. In other words, liberty must be ordered. In order to be a free people, you've got to have character and virtue. If you don't have character and virtue, you're going to be an enslaved person. What the Apostle Paul says. Everything's permissible for me, but not everything's beneficial. So we understand liberty must have some framework around it or else it gets out of control. Case in point, God's saying there's two trees, okay? Hey, life, trends, you know, there's boundaries here. There's certain limits. There's parameters here, okay? So, so in other words, a conservative Protestant will say there must be liberty to our order. Is unlimited free speech a good thing? We would say no. On a couple of reasons, and the, the unbelievers would say this, it's not good, it's not healthy to yell fire in a crowded theater. But it's also not healthy to make and print and distribute pornography because of how it destroys lives. Okay? In other words, so liberty's got to be ordered. Okay? For progressive Protestants, the state is the main sphere of cultural engage, engagement because they see government as the solution to many of citizens' problems. They really do. That explains your radical left in Congress right now. They really think that we can be most free if government takes more control. Um, uh, a conservative Protestant thinks uh, uh, private, res individual responsibility is really important. Be responsible for your life. Be responsible for your health. Be responsible if you want to get a vaccination or not. You know, be, versus a progressive Protestant would say, you are not always as responsible as you should be, so government will begin to move you in that direction to help you, because I'm here to help you. Mm -hmm. I am your nanny state, or something like that. We talked about, did we talk about de Tocqueville last week in his section of Democracy in America, where he talks about, it's called uh, soft despotism. And he said, listen, this principle of equality in America 
causes me, and it was, this is really prophetic, what he said. This principle of equality, everyone wants to be equal in America, is going to lead people to start looking to the government to bring them equal with their other neighbors who don't have as much as they have. And what's going to happen is these people are going to shift from being like people prepared for adulthood to fend for themselves to we're going to look to the government just like a child would look to a parent to keep giving them handouts. And he said, so instead of people in America being prepared for adulthood to take care of themselves, they will begin to become more childlike and they will learn to love it. Okay, very powerful. In fact, it's my favorite section of the whole because you're like, oh my gosh, and he wrote this in 1834 or whatever. He foresaw the American entitlement state. He foresaw interest group politics. All these interest groups clamoring for the government, for my rights, my this, my that. So who becomes your savior in that context? The government does. That is very much how progressive Protestants tend to favor that. They, they tend to look at government as more of a solution. So federally mandated social programs would flourish on this worldview and increasing taxes to fund their existence. So the strength of the state and local governments would get smaller in this worldview. Okay? And, and that's what we're seeing. Okay, so let's talk about this a little bit. Liberty, again, liberty for a conservative means freedom from government, allowing people to act independently. Okay? In other words, a truly conservative viewpoint would be like, I don't want to pay into Social Security. I want to take that money that I would pay in, and I would rather invest it myself. Because I think I'm going to have more money by the time I retire than the 1200 bucks a month or whatever it is that I get. Okay? Right? Because they think, I, I know how to spend my money better than the government does. Okay? Um, so, um, but, but for progressive Protestants, it means, liberty means freedom from want, freedom from oppression through government. So you can be free. Again, I, I think I talked about this a little bit last week. So much of the modern entitlement state comes from FDR, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who drew so much from Woodrow Wilson and, and the progressive movement. And he said in his 1944 speech to Congress, necessitous men are not free men. Needy people are the stuff of which dictatorships are made. So I'm going to propose a second bill of rights to start providing for the American people free health care, free education. Right to a job, right to a wage that is fair for your job, a right to a house, a right to a vacation. And he goes on and on this whole list. He said, I'm, I'm proposing a second bill of rights. That is very much a progressive mindset. Freedom from want through government. You cannot be free unless government makes you free. And, free, and if you think of all those things, okay, wages, um, uh, a home, retirement, health care, all of these are material things. What did Jesus say? Man shall not live by bread alone. But see, government has shifted by thinking that the only way you can be free is if your material needs are satisfied. And from a conservative Protestant standpoint, we'd say, whoa, I get it. You know, having a home to live in is much better than living out in the streets at the mercy of the elements. I get that. But we would say, you know, earn your bread and make your money and get your home. Or whatever you got to do. Don't government's not going to provide that for you. That, yeah. Anyway. Okay. Um, and so, so government is the agent of change and the source of goods. Progressive Protestants have no problem with social engineering. What is social engineering? Again, advocating certain policies to motivate, coerce, make the American people think in a different way. The, the uh, I'll say this, this will probably get controversial, but oh well. You know, the Brown versus Board of Education case in 1954 that sought to desegregate the school systems is a very good example of social engineering. Impatient for change because Congress didn't create a law to deal with it and local governments didn't create a law, the Supreme Court weighed in. And so they forced the races to integrate. How did that go for the next 17, 20 years? And, 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 you know, again, I'm not saying segregation is a good thing. I, I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying when you begin to do that, as I told my class on Friday, what's going to change the human heart concerning prejudice? The federal government? 
or perhaps something else? And if so, what is that? Is the federal government, does it have the ability to change the human heart? And to a person, my class said no. But, but that's exactly what the federal government tried to do. Obergefell v. Hodges, social engineering. Impatient for Congress to make gay marriage the law of the land, they said, we'll do it ourselves. We'll, we'll do it ourselves, thank you. And it forced that. And the problem with law is it's didactic, it teaches. So people begin to think that that's normal. And that has led to Sochi laws and the rage that is transgenderism right now. That all came because of Obergefell. Had Obergefell not happened, none of these other groups would have been emboldened to push that agenda. So, yeah. so liberty is, again, liberty is understood from a poetic viewpoint. Can you remember the poetic? We talked about this before. There's two ways to look at reality. There is a poetic viewpoint and a mimetic viewpoint, okay? Mimetic, this is what you know, whether you know how to say the term, okay? I conform myself to something higher than myself. So I will conform myself to reality. In other words, God's reality, right? Is it, is it from, from what it means to be human, to human sexuality, to what a marriage is, to uh, 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 the laws of sowing and reaping, if you don't work, you don't eat, right? All these things, hey, if I don't, take care of myself and start making money, whatever, I'm gonna be poor and I'm not gonna, in other words, I, I can't wait for someone else to, to help, I, I've gotta do it. Reality says, sowing and reaping, dis, despite my mood and my feelings, doesn't stop. Just like the law of, I don't believe in the law of gravity. I don't believe in it, it's me. Okay, go up at the top of the Sears Tower and jump off. You know, I don't care if you disagree with it, it's gonna, does that make sense? A poetic view is exactly the opposite. I can form reality to myself. So self, feelings, preferences, moods, that's what's really real, not what's out there. That's where, that's why Caitlyn Jenner is not Bruce Jenner anymore. That is very much, this is who I am, you know? This is who I am. I'm a, I'm a man trapped in a woman's body. That is the poetic view, okay? So, so the world is raw material to make it whatever I want it to be. Okay? So reality is conformed to the self. Progressive Protestants tend to think that way. That's why they're sympathetic to the gay movement because they say, hey, people can't help themselves. They're born that way or whatever. Instead of, okay, whereas we would say, no, you conform yourself to the higher reality, God's word. Right? They say, no, you conform God's word to yourself. Lest we pick on them too much, all of us at one point in time, I'm sure, in our Christian life, have sought to conform the world, the, the word, to your own feelings on an issue. And you got rebellious, if, you, if we're honest. Right? Yeah. Sure, you know, so, but they take it to, I mean, this is on steroids, to where there's complete disconnect from, yeah. And, and, and it's what I've said before. The hope that I have in the midst of this is... People that do this still live in God's world. And God has not suspended the laws of sowing and reaping. Sooner or later, these people are going to come up against something harsh. It's called reality. I mean, reality is God's world and the moral universe and sowing and reaping. And, and yeah, and my prayer is that we can reach them, okay? Um, so on social issues such as politics, secularism, gender equality, LGBTQ rights, constitutional interpretation, progressive Protestants ref consider freedom as the right to behave as you desire, as long as you don't harm anyone else. That is called utilitarian ethics. The greatest good for the greatest amount of people, as long as nobody gets hurt. As long as two people consent, you can do whatever you want. So there is no higher moral framework holding the individual to the accountability. It's, hey, for the good of everyone, let's allow more freedom in this particular area. See how different it, that, that's called utilitarian ethics. That drives so much of American law today, okay? But it does not reflect any kind of moral framework that's higher than the self or human reason. If it doesn't, if it doesn't uh, affect anybody else, what is it doing to them, morally? But again, if, if, if you're embracing a, a poetic view of the world, and that, hey, I can form reality to the self, and the self is not sinful, no, nothing's happening to them. In fact, you're harming them if you're preventing them 
from doing that. Convoluted logic. Con really opposite thinking, but that, that's it. Whereas as Christians, we, we would say, j just as so many people are champions of the environment in the physical realm, we would say we're champions of the environment in the moral and spiritual realm, and that what you do privately in your own home affects other people because you cannot not be affected by pornography. You cannot not be affected by a lifestyle in opposition to God, whether it's drug addiction, pick your addiction. It cannot not affect co-workers, loved ones, neighbors, family members, ultimately, if unchecked. Again, that's why conservative Protestants would, would have strong laws against pornography, strong laws against some of these you know, marijuana. Well, it's not a, it's not a, uh, what's, the, what's the term of that drug, drug? Doc would know what it's called. The drugs that cause you to be addicted, that you don't prescribe. There's a particular drug that you don't. Narcotics. That, narcotics, there you go, yeah. It's a non-narcotic, you know. So, but, but we would say, wait a minute, hold on. What is it doing to that person? Is it leading to human flourishing? Is, is human flourishing checking out and just being in this phased out state all the time? We would say no. We would say, wait a minute, that, that's not. So we would advocate laws regulating that and permit, prohibiting that. You see the difference? And so, so that, that's where we would be against utilitarianism. But, but in God's reality, it is harming them in some way or another, right? The way God said, yes, yes. they are being harmed. Well, but God gave humans every herb from the ground. Dude, marijuana's an herb. <laughs> we would say, again, we would, okay, from a pure biblical standpoint, this might not hold up in legislation. But we would use the word that Paul talks about when he says about witchcraft, pharmakia, drugs. But we would say, wait a minute, okay, what is, what is witchcraft? It leads to manipulation, intimidation, and control. We would say someone beholden to marijuana usage is manipulated, intimidated, and controlled in a way that is not how God made us to be, so we would want to regulate that. Now, public policy has to phrase it differently, but that's what, right? That's how we'd understand it. Mm -hmm. I don't care if it's an herb, it's going to lead to some form of witchcraft. For, again, it's the same, some form of drug usage. Whether it's smoking peyote or whatever. Yeah. Well, pharmaceuticals, that's all drugs. So, how many people in America, almost everybody, take some kind of a drug? Right. And that, there's nothing wrong with legitimate prescribed medication from a doctor or something. But it's different from, again, giving yourself over to something to where you, A, you become addicted. You know, if you're so free, stop. If you're so free, stop using it. Right? If, if, you, if, if, if in taking marijuana I'm free, then stop. If you can't, you've given yourself over to it. Not, and then I'm not even talking about what happens to you when you're high. From a biblical standpoint, we would say that, that's, that's pharmakia. That's equivalent to some form of witchcraft. You've given yourself over. You're under the influence of something that is controlling your mind, your emotions. That, that's how we would see it. Now, trying to argue that in the public square in a very permissive society is more difficult. But that's exactly why the Michigan legislature didn't decide for it themselves. They made it a ballot initiative because they were too wimpy to weigh in. You will find that legislators are very wimpy in weighing in because they'd rather defer to a ballot initiative, the courts, the president, or something like that. Instead of going on record, I am against this because dun, 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 and get reelected. All right, I'm going to end for today, and um, we'll continue next week. Oh, actually, in two weeks, because it's acoustic worship next Sunday, okay? Take care, everybody.